Uh, welcome to Conversations with Comfort. I, this is the maiden edition. What, wow. what we intend to do as Africa Policy Center is to really meet some of the brains uh, that we can discuss issues around policy and research with. Uh, we recognize that uh, that's what our mandate is as uh, Africa Policy Africa Center. Policy. Mm. So, uh, first of all, I would like you to briefly tell us about yourself. I know you're the Deputy Vice Chancellor mm. Academic Affairs at Uganda Christian University, but a little bit about you that most of us might not know. Mm. Uh, comfort, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, and it is great that I am having the chance to chat with you on this maiden episode of this conversation. Uh, we hope that we shall have many more interesting conversations here. My name is John Molindwa Chitaimbwa. I am married to Lydia Chitaimbwa and uh, we are blessed to have three children. Uh, two girls and uh, one boy. Uh, my education is very interesting. I think that's one of the things that people don't know about me. But I'm both a scientist and an artist. Oh, yes. Uh, please explain that because these days this conversation around being a scientist and, a art and an artist is so very I'm, I'm interesting. The, I'm the best person to discuss. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, uh, in fact, I am a pure scientist, an applied scientist, and an artist. I am a pure, a pure scientist in the sense that my first MSc degree, which I did, was in pure mathematics. Oh. So, I'm a, a pure mathematician. And then I did another MSc, but this time in a more applied area of the sciences, okay. which was in uh, computational biology. Oh. So I have uh, an MSc in computational biology as well, and it is that area that I took to the PhD. So my PhD is also in that area. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because computational <laughs> yes. biology sounds very complicated. It is, much is, it is much easier than the pure mathematics. <laughs> so that's a bit more applied okay. and more data driven and more like the things you'd want to do under the Africa Policy Center. Okay. And uh, I am an artist because I've recently done an M field in divinity, yes. the Masters in divinity which is on the other side of the spectrum. Mm. So I am both an artist and a scientist, and therefore I enjoy the debate of the so sciences. So you're likely to be more sympathetic to us, the artists. <laughs> <laughs> and I've also understand been told, us better, since you're coming at it from actually a divinity uh, angle. I've also been told that at, uh, beyond the uh, undergraduate level, mm. uh, these two disciplines sort of merge. That's true. And, uh, and so you don't... Uh, you don't find uh, that very clear distinction between yeah. the arts and the sciences. Because yes. when we do this, the research, we again use the scientific method. We'll then dive straight into the real reason we are having this conversation, which mm. is research and policy. Uh, where do you see the link between research and policy? From where you stand, both as a, an academic mm. uh, and also uh, an administrator in an mm. academic institution. Mm. I think um, there is a very good link mm. between research and the policy mm. because um, research helps us to come up with new findings mm. or helps us to discover things that have been unknown to us before mm. and therefore with these new discoveries mm. there can be a very good linkage between those new findings mm. and uh, the policies that we then come up with. So we now have the concept of uh, uh, research-driven policies or research-informed policies. Mm. You know when you do make a policy, in most cases you are really walking into the unknown. Yeah. But you are trying to mitigate or to control what is unknown. Mm. And so it helps when you do make such policies to sort of have some kind of informed opinion. And uh, research helps us to have a basis on which Mm. we can make informed decisions. And the world today is even much more interesting because all around us now we have data. Mm. And um, in the public square, in the public entities, private entries, we have all this data around us. Do you think so few uh, of us actually in developing countries mm. do take that approach of, uh, of answering life's questions using policies that are driven by uh, data. 
I think the, the, the simple answer is the experts involved. It is, um, first of all, it is expensive mm -hmm. to do good research. And so there are very few people and governments and uh, uh, NGOs that are willing to pay for this kind of engagement. Because research, good research is very expensive. First and foremost, before you can train the people that can be able to do good research, that training alone mm. is an expensive venture. Some of the discoveries we're using now, for example, in the, the control of the COVID-19 pandemic, some of these discoveries were made 30 years ago. And at the time when they made these discoveries 30 years ago to a person in the public square, these appeared like very useless findings. Because 30 years ago they might not have had a direct impact Contact. on what was happening. Mm. But it is because of what was discovered 30 years ago that we are having the kind of response that we have had say, for COVID-19. Mm. For example, we are able to manufacture a vaccine, mm. COVID vaccine, under uh, one year. Mm. And I think that was really a miracle on its own, having mm. a vaccine uh, discovered, manufactured, and approved within 12 months. Actually, it's, it's interesting that you use the example of COVID and the vaccines, and, and uh, if anything has exposed our little interaction with uh, science, mm -hmm. it is COVID-19. What do we, uh, as uh, African countries, for example, have to do mm -hmm. in order to venture into that kind of uh, research, doing research for research sake? I think it is, on the face of it, it is expensive. Yeah. But it is much cheaper than the actual expense you'd incur if you didn't have research. Let me use COVID again to give an example. Mm -hmm. For example, we are now mostly using decisions mm -hmm. from the north to inform our decisions here in, uh, in Africa. Let me take an example of Uganda. Mm -hmm. We have been talking about vaccination mm -hmm. and we have been talking about how many people have got to be vaccinated and you have heard about things like herd immunity, mm. and we have derived the thresholds for this herd immunity, and I think it's been mentioned somewhere that we need 21 million Ugandans mm. to be vaccinated if mm. we are going to attain any level of herd immunity. Mm. I think you have heard of that magic yes, number. Yes. And uh, we have also heard from the North that eight months after receiving the initial vaccines, you need booster doses. Yeah. But if you looked at the Ugandan problem, and localized the Ugandan problem, mm. you would actually find that the threshold that we have derived for the herd immunity is the wrong one. Mm. Because when you look at, for example, the connectivity mm. between uh, the people or the towns in Uganda, mm. and you compare that with the connectivity in, of London or New York, these are different. Assuming that our governments do not take um, research very seriously, we are research-led institutions, what can we actually do? to support that system. Maybe before I answer that question, yeah. can I just uh, say something about research? Yes. Uh, by just giving an example of Google, mm. the company called Google, for them they have understood the benefits of investment in research. Mm. And what Google has done for the last 15 years is to invest a lot in research. And they invest in almost any kind of research. But as you realize, they have the understanding that if they invest in 100 projects for research, about 98% of those ones will fail mm. and they will be useless. Mm. But the two... And it is okay to the, fail. Yes, the two yeah. that succeed are able to pay for the growth that is okay. needed by uh, Google. And so that two, those two out of 100, are good enough, they are in fact very good for the sustainability and the profitability mm. of Google. The reason why they do that is that they have looked at nature and for them they are copying the model from nature, from God. And so this is what nature is about. Um, nature in itself. You, 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 you really amuse me because uh, yeah. you, you, you have a way of weaving. <laughs> but this is very true. This is what, and this is what is we did to, 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 this is what we did to, to, to learn yeah. and learn quickly as African countries. Yeah. Nature in itself is very wasteful. Um, but it is through that wastefulness that life is passed on 
in its best form from one generation to the other. And they said if as a Uganda, first of all we enact good laws that will um, promote research. If as Uganda, for example, we produce as Nepal has told us, we, we invest 1% of our GDP on research. If we fund about 1,000 projects in the universities, in the schools, in the, the community, then maybe at the end of the year, about five of these will be very, very successful projects. But those five, the income that you'll get out of the five will more than pay for the expenses that you incur in all the other businesses. This is the same model that the pharmaceuticals use. Because, for example, Pfizer, mm. when it was coming up with um, the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, at inception, Pfizer did not have only that vaccine that That's it is true. having now. It had over 100 candidates for the vaccine. For the vaccine yeah. But at the end of the day, only one mm. made it. But can you imagine how much money Pfizer has made out of that one vaccine? And so this is the same knowledge that we ought to uh, to apply. To and, and, and you know, you've just reminded me when we have students defending their dissertations for research and mm. the question we are asking them is what impact is your research going to make? You know, mm. It's like you must be doing research that is going to create a lot of impact and yet mm. Mm. you could never really be sure you, and yet you still have to do the research in order for some of it Mm. to be able to make that kind of impact. That's and I think really it is one of the, the problems in the research, uh, in the search, research community. Mm. So we have created this mindset mm. that every time somebody does research, mm. the results have got to be positive mm. and they have got to be impactful. Mm. And uh, this is a wrong concept, mm. especially if you want to have research that is going to have a long-lasting impact. Mm. Some of the research that we have got to do now mm. will inform practice a hundred years from now. Mm. It is not going to inform practice now. That's but it true. is very important that we do this research now. Mm. Because a hundred years from now, when the COVID-19 pandemic-like illness strikes, they will not have the time to undertake the research. That, that's true, like mm. most, much of the climate change research that was done was done many years ago. Yeah. And when you talk about the, the NEPAD, let's talk about the new partnership for Africa's development and mm. it's 1% um, uh, expenditure for, you know, 1% of GDP for research. Mm. Not many African countries have actually, you know, despite signing, mm. have actually spent that much on research. <laughs> Do we also have similar ones for universities to say, as you see, you one percent of our budget is going to go to research? And I think at UCU uh, we spend more than one percent of the budget hmm. on research, but uh, the issue is that our budget is still very small. Hmm. So one percent translates into something that is not that, uh, much. that not that much, but. We have started moving mm. because when you are going to move in that direction, mm. you need also to start. Mm. You need to be practical. For Would example, you like to inspire us by telling us a little bit of some of the things we are doing to move? One of this? the things is um, one of the things that drives research mm. is the environment and the policies in place to enable the researchers to thrive. Mm. And so we have done a revision of our research policy, and we have. Uh, added a lot of incentives uh, for members of staff to engage in research. Mm -hmm. And some of these uh, um, benefits are financial, but others are really professional incentives mm -hmm. to do this. And I think in this country now, there is no better research institution or university mm -hmm. that has got a policy to match what we have at Uganda Christian University. Oh, Secondly, nice. we have in Africa uh, we have a misconception mm. that when you do research, even an undergraduate student can do research, even a, a master's student can do research, good research, mm. even a PhD can do research. Mm. And yet our brothers and sisters in the north, when you see the way they've organized themselves, mm. they organize themselves around the labs mm. and the centers. Mm. And so when you look at a research lab, mm. you find that a research lab is uh, headed by a professor or professors. Mm. And then underneath that you have a set of fellow professors 
mm. and then post docs mm. and then below the post docs you have PhDs mm. and then before the PhDs you have the master students and mm. then possibly undergraduate students mm. and so if you're going to have good high quality research you need leadership mm. because like in the Bible for us with the Bible we say anointing mm. flows from the head yes. and so even here if you're going to do good research you need high caliber professors mm. to be able to strategically mm. think about the research, to strategically come up with the questions that we need to answer mm. and drive the research agenda. Mm. And that's why in UC we have now that very good uh, uh, program for professors where each year we are going to fund one or two professors mm. not to engage in research mm. but actually to start research groups mm. or research labs mm. so that we can have a professor mentoring postdocs mm. and then a, a professor postdocs mentoring phds and so on and so forth that mm. research pyramid mm. is missing in the universities the other thing we have done is of course to start appointing research staff or research faculty these are staff members that are appointed specifically to engage in research and that's why oh, now, wow. yeah, you are one of them. I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am just thinking of the possibility of having it across yes. because I no, know no, that this I'm one, one we, are, we, are, we are having that's it across really now huge. and we are opening it up. So we are going to have and we are starting to appoint postdocs for mm. example at UCU mm. whose work is going to be in research. We are going to appoint professors, research professors, mm. research chairs Mm. who are not going to be concerned so much with teaching mm. and innovation. And I think well, that's, that's exciting. The other thing that is being uh, muted is the idea that because of the centrality of research mm. in the university, they are planning to now make it a division so that okay. uh, it is headed by a deputy vice chancellor. So we shall be having a deputy vice chancellor in charge of research partnerships and innovation. And innovation. So that's... I've seen a nice vehicle. There's somewhere. already a vehicle that has, uh, <laughs> that has, that yeah. has already been purchased yeah. even before uh, somebody comes in. But that mm. really shows you that uh, we are bringing research mm. to the center. You know the core mandate of a university mm. is found in its teaching, mm. research and outreach. Mm. But we want to have a model that brings research to the center mm. so that our teaching is informed by the research. Mm. Our outreach is informed by the research. research. And our innovation is also informed by the research. Mm. The research should be at the center of mm. what we do. And I think that this would be very exciting. This seems to be like an exciting time to be at UCU then, yeah. <laughs> with the research playing such a central role. We pray that we are able to, to, uh, to see the benefits of this. Mm. But I think it, uh, it pays mm. for a university to think this way. Mm. It is also, you know, some of the policies that have been adopted by government mm. uh, in Uganda, especially concerning the education sector, mm. there is a, a likelihood that we are going to miss a full academic year mm. where we shall not be having any first year students coming in. And that means for university, like Uganda Christian University, which is, which is entirely funded by the university itself. Mm. If you have got a high dependence on tuition fees alone, mm. you will not be able to survive. Because this is going to happen. It mm. is going to happen very quickly. It might happen next year. Mm. Because, you know, we have two senior five classes. Mm. And the one which is ahead has only done one term and it has not completed it. And so yeah. next year we might not have an admission. And, and so if you don't have, then that means the universities are going to see the centrality mm. of engaging in research and innovation mm. as a, a core mandate of the university. Because mm. most of the Ugandan universities, unfortunately, mm. have their focus on teaching mm. and learning. And these other areas are really, they are very weak there. Yeah, actually, one, one of the things that uh, I observed during this season of mm. COVID, and especially with the education sector you're talking mm. about, is uh, 
is how much uh, the changes that were happening at a policy level remain mm. really closed to those who should be informing it, mm. uh, like uh, those from the research industry, you know, informing um, the the policy makers of what would work best mm. uh, in the event that uh, you know a year is lost. Mm. Uh, are we going to, to to see a situation where academics and um, and researchers in general uh, sit on the other side waiting for policy makers to, to do their thing, sort of, in, in, in quotes. Yeah. Or uh, academics and researchers will actually try as much as possible to engage them. Who, who should engage who in this process, especially as we talk about the research uh, policy linkages? I think um, in terms of engagement, mm. um, the the one that works in Africa. You know, we have grown up in an African community. Mm -hmm. And in Africa, we have elders. You, have, you grew up with your mom and dad. Yeah. Even if you had the best advice for your mom and dad, sometimes it is yes. best for <laughs> your dad to seek the advice than the vice versa. The child yes. can try, but if it is going to work well, mm -hmm. it is even much easier for the policy makers to come down. Yeah. And so we have this issue but what should we do? Mm. And I think that can really help. Mm. We have also had the challenge, maybe since we're talking about policy. Mm. Can I just air this out? Yes, please. Especially in responding, we have made ma huge mistakes as African countries. And uh, Uganda has not been spared. Mm. And uh, a lot of these mistakes have come from our policy makers. Mm. And uh, it is uh, the place of policy and regulation when you are dealing with a crisis. Yeah. You see, we have been told that when you are managing in a crisis, it is like you are shooting at a moving target. Yes, that's true. And so if you're going to shoot at a moving target, that means that every now and then, you have got to reevaluate the strategy. Mm. And uh, you are supposed to adapt that strategy, depending on where the animal is. Mm. Now, policies, are documents that are majorly very static. And yet in a time of crisis, mm. you are looking at adaptability, mm. you are looking at innovation. Mm. And so what other countries have done, and this is what they did with the vaccines, and this is what they have done with the education sector, is that you let the sector move and innovate. Mm. And then the policy kind is supposed to follows. follow mm. the innovation. So that as the people are innovating and they are implementing, you walk behind them and you regulate because you have some data. For, it, for them the enabling environment uh -huh. actually. Yeah. You, you have the data and then with this data you can make very informed decisions and then you regulate. Mm. Now the challenge we have had, we've had with many African countries is that the policy has come before the innovation. Mm. And when there is a policy before innovation then you kill all manner of innovation. Mm. Because you are not then allowed to make mistakes. Mm. Research, like we discussed at the beginning, mm. involves making mistakes. Research involves a lot of mistakes mm. because research is about uh, making sure that you prove something to either be right mm. or wrong. Mm. And sometimes when you prove that something is wrong, mm. to some other person it might be a mistake. Wow. And uh, I've also been told that you know the universities mm. exist so that dogma does not become established. And so if you don't if they exist for that purpose, that means at the university this should be the place where we are questioning almost everything. Mm. And we are playing around with almost everything. Mm. And in that questioning and playing around mm. there are so many mistakes that will be made. But it is through those mistakes mm. that we will discover something very ingenious. Wow, and wow, so to wow. the policy makers one of the pleas we can make as African countries mm. is that we should never let policies inhibit innovation. Absolutely. We should always let the innovations to go way ahead of the policy mm. and then you can regulate as you go. Wow. This conversation with Comfort has been very, very interesting and mm. I think that we have the potential to continue. The sun has come on us. Yeah. <laughs> we have the potential to continue for it so long. Sam who has, <laughs> but, who has sent but, the sun to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. but I, I look forward to having uh, more yeah. of these kinds of conversations yeah. because I think that uh, people really have to appreciate the mm. role of research. In our university settings, uh, most people uh, think that research is for some kinds of people. Mm. In fact, 
when uh, this whole policy around uh, creating uh, research groups uh, that uh, clustered around professors came up, I, I did hear a few concerns about, um, okay, are they now, now, not now, you know, putting um, a kind of stumbling block for emerging scholars, for example, when will they grow as researchers, and yet they, they, they should be closely knit together, you know, it, it should be a team that actually uh, builds one another. One of the markers that was measured in the award of these grants was how well formed the mm. team was, mm. that below the professor, mm. what were the linkages that were being built up, mm. who were the undergraduates involved mm. in this kind of venture, the mm. postgraduates, mm. the PhDs, mm. the junior faculty, mm. because at the end of the day, a professor's role mm. uh, is more to do with mentorship mm. and grooming the next generation of these researchers. Mm. But we need that wise head somehow mm. to be able to guide our thought. Mm. so that we do not walk in like a, blind like, men. Like blind men. men. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chitayimbwa. I look forward to another conversation like this. I would like to give you an opportunity to, yes. to have a closing shot. Yes. Uh, what you, given everything we have discussed, mm. to just uh, have your final say. Mm. I think it is uh, interesting what the Africa Policy Center is trying to do. And... Uh, I look forward to the work ahead of us and uh, to us as a university we are looking to this Af Africa Policy Center to guide even our decisions in terms of the research that you are coming up with. We, have, we are grappling with so many problems and um, some of these uh, problems uh, need an African touch.